Welcome back, everybody. Um, our, our next presenter is a retired lawyer who practiced corporate law for over 30 years with two blue chip law firms until he retired in 2008. Since then, he has published four books in the spiritual metaphysical genre, Dancing on a Stamp, Dancing Forever with Spirit, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, and Dance of Eternal Rapture which recount his dialogue and astral travels with his spirit guide, Albert, who confronted him on the street one day disguised as a homeless man. After the release of his first book, uh, he's been active with book signing tours, speaking engagements, and has been interviewed on over 150 radio stations around the world. <clears throat> In addition, he is a level two quantum healing hypnosis technique practitioner a uh, modality that guides clients to experience past lives and connect with their uh, higher selves. He will recount some of his astral trips with his spirit guide. Um, he, including an encounter with a race of um, super intelligent spider-like creatures who organized the seeding of life on Earth, a visit to an ET spacecraft orbiting our planet, the building of Stonehenge by a giant human from the Andromeda constellation, a trip to a planet with an advanced human civilization that had no toxic emotions. Um, I wish we could vacation there right now. A meeting with a blue alien who lived among humans on our planet and a rendezvous with Earth in a parallel universe where quirks in its history resulted in much less racial and religious conflicts. So please join me in welcoming Garnet Schulhauser. So good morning, everyone. Um, as Forrest mentioned to me, uh, or mentioned to you rather, I am the author of four books in the spiritual metaphysical genre, Dancing on a Stamp, Dancing Forever with Spirit, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, and Dance of Eternal Rapture. And all of my books deal with my dialogue and astral travels with my spirit guide, Albert. Now on many of my astral trips, as you will find out uh, uh, further on in my presentation, I encountered several advanced ET races and advanced human civilizations on different planets, which are really quite fascinating. And I'll share some of those with you today. Today, I will talk about uh, my encounters with two super intelligent non-human races, the truth about the 1947 Roswell crash, a meeting with a blue alien living on earth disguised as a human, a trip to an advanced human civilization governed solely by women, startling revelations about the new earth and how to make the ascension, and fascinating information about earth in a parallel universe. But before I get into the details of my astral travels, I'd like to share a few details of my background and to tell you a bit about how I got to where I am now. I was born and raised in Saskatchewan in a very strict Roman Catholic family. After I graduated from law school, I practiced corporate law in Calgary for 34 years until I retired in 2008. Eventually, uh, as I grew older, I rejected many of the beliefs of the Catholic Church and I began searching for a new paradigm to latch onto. And I asked myself over and over the eternal questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? What happens when I die? And is there life elsewhere in the universe? And then one fateful day in 2007, my answers were all uh, came to me from a, a homeless man that accosted me on the street one day. It happened when I was still practicing law. I was walking down the street one sunny afternoon in May when suddenly a homeless man jumped out of the shadows and stopped me in my tracks. And he looked like a typical homeless man. He had long stringy hair, scraggly beard, and dirty slept in clothes. But I didn't walk around him as I typically would do when I met homeless people on the street because he had these amazing dazzling blue eyes that sparkled like two little blue stars. His gaze seemed to penetrate deep within me right to the depths of my soul. And at the same time, his gaze was sending me this wave of pure, unconditional love that was infusing my whole body with an amazing sense of peace and security. I was like a deer caught in the headlights. 
I was in a time warp. I had no idea how long I stood there. And finally, this man broke the spell by saying, why are you here? Then he promptly disappeared into a nearby store. But when I finally snapped, snapped out of my reverie and collected my wits, I went into the store to try to find this man, but he was nowhere to be seen. So I walked outside and I searched on the street up and down for maybe 15 or 20 minutes, hoping to spot him, but he had seemingly disappeared into thin air. Well, the next day I came back to the same street, this very same time of day, hoping to spot this homeless man. And after searching without uh, any luck for several minutes, I finally spotted him sitting all alone on a bench. When I asked him who he was and why he had stopped me, he said he was a soul just like me and he had come to answer my questions and help me on my journey. And that was the beginning of a dialogue I had with him that went off and on for several months. I found out his name was Albert and he was actually one of my spirit guides in disguise. Albert proved to be a wise and compassionate spirit who had a great sense of humor. He told me early on that he had chosen me to be one of his messengers and that he wanted me to write a book about his revelations so they would be available to everyone. At first, I was reluctant to write a book because I had never even dreamed of writing a book before. But after some gentle persuasion from Albert, I wrote the manuscript for my very first book, Dancing on a Stamp, which was published in 2012. During the course of our dialogue, Albert disclosed many startling new revelations about life, death, the afterlife, and the existence of life in our universe. Among other things, Albert told me, there are billions and billions of life forms in the universe. Some of the life forms are much more advanced than humans on Earth. And many of the advanced races have visited our planet since the early days, and they continue to do so. Their spacecraft are usually undetectable by humans because of their cloaking devices, but sometimes they are seen by humans on Earth as UFOs. The ETs deliberately reveal some of their spacecraft to humans to, par to prepare us for the time when they will make full and open contact with all humans. All the ET races who have visited our planet are benevolent and they cause us no harm. I also found out that all the advanced peace-loving races in our galaxy belong to the Galactic Federation, which monitors the aggressive barbaric civilizations to ensure that they cannot wage war on other planets. Because of the rules established by the Federation, much like the prime directive in Star Trek, the advanced DTs are not permitted to unduly interfere with the development of an inferior race, but they are allowed to prevent malevolent races from waging wars on other civilizations. Although generally they cannot overtly interfere with the events on Earth, they have helped humans over the ages in very subtle ways by giving us uh, inspiration for technology and ways to improve our way of life. This, I found out that the secret to interstellar travel is a warp drive that creates an artificial wormhole around a ship. And that creates a warp or a fold in the space-time continuum. When civilizations first develop warp drive, the Federation will check it out to ensure that they will not use it to wage war on other planets. Well, since publishing my first book, many people have asked me about Albert and what he was really like. Although he was always wise and compassionate, at times he was cheeky and flippant and a bit of a rascal. He liked to tease me about my many human foibles and his favorite story was to tell me about some of the humorous things I did when I was still practicing law. His favorite story was about the time in my very early days when I occasionally went to court. I was representing a man who was in a case against a very large insurance company. We went to court and I was the sole lawyer for this man and the insurance company had two lawyers across the aisle uh, arguing the case for the insurance company. Well, I argued the case as best I could, but we lost. 
As we were leaving the courthouse, my client said to me, I know why we lost. And I said, oh, why? And he said, when the other lawyer was up talking, his colleague was sitting beside him thinking. But when you were talking, there was no one thinking. So much for my spirit guides jokes. My second, third, and fourth books, Dancing Forever with Spirit, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, and Dance of Eternal Rapture, describe my next series of encounters with Albert. It began one night when I was sleeping in my bed and I heard a noise. I woke up and I saw a ghost-like ethereal figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. When it moved closer to me, I could see it was my spirit guide, Albert, but now he was in astral form. When he got closer, Albert said to me, I came to take you on a series of out-of-body adventures to the spirit side and other places in the universe because he said he believed that a picture was worth a thousand words. And he wanted me to describe all the things I would see and hear in my next books. So with Albert as my tour guide, I began my first astral trip uh, to the spirit side. On that very first trip to the spirit side, Albert took me to a beautiful white city called Aglaia. We entered the city through its entrance portal and strolled down the main boulevard. Eventually we came to a majestic building with white pillars lining the front, where we entered a large circular chamber with a high domed ceiling. In the middle of the room was a table in the shape of a semicircle with 11 regal souls seated behind it, all with snow white hair and smooth unblemished skin. Albert told me that this group was the council of wise ones, a group of very wise and advanced souls whose job it was to oversee all the incarnations on, on planet earth. The chair of the council, Sophia, had a message for me to convey to all humans. She said that humanity on earth was at a crucial crossroads. We have progressed a lot since the very early days, but our spiritual and emotional intelligence has not kept pace with our technological achievements. She said that we let our negative emotions like fear, anger, hate, and greed rule too much of our lives and this results in a lot of violence and conflict. She said that humans have weapons of mass destruction that could destroy all life on our planet, and we must work hard to avoid destroying our civilization like some of the other advanced societies in our planet's history, such as Atlantis and Lemuria, and several others that we have not even yet discovered. She said humans must strive to discard their negative emotions and fully embrace love, which will enable all of us to expand our consciousness and raise our vibrations so we can ascend to earth in a higher dimension, also known as 5D earth or the new earth. She told me I was one of their messengers and Albert would take me on some astral excursions so I could make his revelations available through my books. On one of my early trips, Albert took me to a cavern under the North Pole, where I had a conversation with Gaia, the consciousness of Mother Earth. Gaia is the life force of our beautiful planet. The sum total of all rivers, oceans, lakes, mountains, and deserts that form part of the third rock from the sun. Gaia is fiercely protective of her flora and fauna and is very distressed at the abuse humans heap on Mother Earth and her creatures. She voiced her dismay at the way humans dump their garbage into her rivers and oceans, spill toxic chemicals onto her soil, and poison her atmosphere with noxious fumes. Gaia cannot understand why, so, why humans are so destructive to their environment, which is detrimental not only to their health, but to all the other creatures who share our planet. She advised that she was trying to raise her vibrations so she could rise up to a higher dimension, abundant with love and compassion. But the negativity of humans was holding her back. Gaia said she speaks to humans every day through the sounds of nature. The rustle of leaves in the forest, 
the babbling of a brook, and the crashing of surf on a rocky beach. But most humans do not hear her message because they are too busy chasing money and power. She sincerely hoped that humans would curtail their abuse and learn to live in peaceful harmony with Mother Earth and all of her creatures. That way we can ascend to the new Earth to enjoy the love and splendor of a higher dimension. Well, as Albert led me out of that cavern, I expressed my surprise that our planet had a consciousness. But Albert said that Gaia had many more surprises up her sleeve, and he agreed to show me a few of her secrets. To make his point, Albert next took me to a forest in the Pacific Northwest of America, where he introduced me to one of Earth's fabled creatures, a Sasquatch named Zana. She was around nine feet tall, with an ape-like head and a muscular body covered in dark brown hair. Zana told me that her species originated in Africa eons ago, when a now extinct primate was inseminated with the semen from a race of humanoid ETs. She said the Sasquatch have secretly coexisted for centuries with humans and have been known by many different names, such as Bigfoot, Yeti, and the Abominable Snowman. They have been careful to avoid contact with humans because they view us to be violent and aggressive. And they feared that if they made contact with humans, they would be poked and prodded in our labs or displayed as circus freaks. I learned that Zana and her kin are sensitive and intelligent beings who communicate by telepathy and live in harmony with Mother Earth and her creatures. They have an animal sensitive radar that allows them to detect humans from many miles away and this has helped them avoid detection. They have rejected developing technology in favor of living simple lives close to nature. Her parting words were for humans to stop their violence and aggression so they could live in peaceful coexistence with the Sasquatch. So I was deeply troubled by the predicament of Zana and her race, who were forced to hide in underground caves to escape human contact. I hope someday that they would feel comfortable living openly among humans. As we left the forest where I met Zana, I asked Albert to explain the difference between a Bigfoot and a human. Albert said, that's easy. He says one has thick matted hair and smells awful, while the other has big feet. So much for trying to get a straight answer out of Albert. And then to demonstrate that the universe is also full of surprises, Albert took me on a trip to a planet many light years from Earth. It was a beautiful water planet called Proteus, which looked much like Earth, except that it had no land masses and was entirely covered by oceans. We dropped down through the clouds and submerged under the water, where the sea life under this planet looked very much like the sea life under the oceans of Earth. Albert led me towards a large coral reef where we met with two creatures that looked like a humpback whale and a dolphin. These creatures tell me they look familiar because most of the sea life on Earth had been seeded from life on Proteus eons ago with the help of more advanced races in the galaxy. They told me they kept in telepathic contact with the dolphins and whales on Earth, and they did not like what they heard. They implored me to ask humans on Earth to stop abusing their kin, who are tired of being hunted and trapped by humans. They asserted that whales and dolphins on Earth are highly intelligent beings who want to live in harmony with all the creatures on their planet, including humans, and they cannot understand why humans continue to abuse them without justification. I promise to take their message back to my fellow humans on Earth. And then to reinforce the message I had been given by the cetaceans on Proteus, Albert took me back to Earth to meet with one of our own dolphins. On a small island in the Bahamas, I was delighted to meet Shimmer the dolphin, who spoke to me by telepathy. She was a highly intelligent, spiritually advanced creature 
who communicated with her kin and all other cetaceans by telepathy. She wanted all humans to understand that they are sensitive beings with feelings and emotions, just like humans, and they truly want to live in harmony with the human race. They love our beautiful planet and respect all of her other creatures. They do not pollute Mother Earth because they honor her for all the gifts that she bestows on them every day. They understand that all the creatures on our planet have their own special place in the universe, and they should be allowed to live their lives according to their own agendas without interference from humans. Dolphins are in tune with spirit as they fully understand their connection to each other and to everything else in the universe. They feel that life would be much more pleasant for all creatures on Earth if humans did not interfere with the natural cycle of life on our planet. They lament that humans are like an invasive, out of control weed that is spreading its deadly tentacles around our globe, snuffing out all other life in its path. In their view, humans are violent, aggressive, and disrespectful of their planet and all of its creatures. But they've recently noticed that more and more humans are becoming spiritually aware. And these enlightened people are leading the way toward a kinder and gentler interface with their planet and all of its creatures. They sincerely hope that these spiritually enlightened humans step up their effort to encourage others to espouse love and kindness for everyone and everything on their planet. It must be a concerted effort to pierce the darkness with their beacons of light, and someday we all may once again enjoy paradise on Earth. Well, I was pleasantly surprised to learn I could communicate with shimmers when I was in astral form, and I hoped that one day all humans could hear what dolphins had to say so we could treat them with the dignity and respect that they deserve. But I soon found out that Albert wasn't finished with his surprises as he next took me to a planet near the center of our galaxy. Xeron was a barren planet without any vegetation on its surface, but beneath its surface, it was home to a race of super intelligent spider-like creatures. They told me their job was to monitor our galaxy to look for planets that were capable of harboring life. And when they found such planets, they would advise the Galactic Council who could then arrange for the seeding of life on those planets. Eons ago, they had discovered that Earth was ready to harbor life, and they organized other ET races to seed our planet with life from other worlds. They began with primitive life forms on Earth and gradually moved on up to humans. Thanks to this benevolent race and the other ETs who did the seeding, we can all enjoy the vast diversity of life on our planet. Now, when I pressed Albert for more information about the ETs, Albert said that there were numerous intelligent races in our galaxy, many of which were way more advanced than humans on Earth. And the ability, and they, many of them had the ability to travel between the stars. To prove his point, Albert took me to an ET spacecraft that was orbiting our planet. Inside this gleaming ship, I encountered humanoid beings with gray skin, hairless heads, and large oblong eyes. They advised that their race had been seeding life on Earth since the early days, all at the direction of the Galactic Council, which is the governing body of all the advanced civilizations in our galaxy. As I mentioned earlier, they are not permitted to directly interfere with events on Earth, and they've had to stand by and watch other advanced human civilizations rise up to great heights before they collapsed. But the ETs have been able to help humans in subtle ways by telepathically providing knowledge and technological inspiration to help us whenever possible. They are very concerned that humans have once again reached a transition point where we will either advance up the vibratory ladder or destroy ourselves. Albert said that this race was one of many races of ETs who've been monitoring our planet for eons. 
and the spacecraft I had visited was one of the many different UFOs that have been sighted on Earth over the ages. Albert once again confirmed that all the ETs who have visited Earth over the ages were benevolent creatures who did not in any way endanger humans or the planet we call home. Albert went on to explain that sometimes ETs live among us undetected. And to demonstrate this point, he took me to the University of Oxford in England. We touched down near John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford and waited near the front door. Soon I noticed a pert, neatly dressed lady in her 50s leaving the entrance with a brown paper bag in her hand before settling down on a bench in the shade to enjoy her lunch. Albert said this lady was a professor in the medical school teaching classes in neuroscience. He said she was not a human, but a member of an ET race many light years from Earth. She had been planted here nine years before, disguised as a human, and her human name was Amanda. Her ET race had been visiting and monitoring life on Earth for many years, and they often created human disguises to allow them to live among us without being detected. This allowed them to closely monitor human behavior patterns so they could better understand how we functioned. Then Albert waved his hand over Amanda and her human facade slowly disappeared, allowing us to see her natural state. She was a blue humanoid creature with a large bald head and shining black eyes. She had arms and legs similar to humans, except she had five fingers and a thumb on each hand. She looked to be around six feet tall. She wore a silver metallic jumpsuit that glittered in the sunlight. As soon as she was revealed to us, she smiled and spoke to us by telepathy. She said her race has very advanced technology that is light years beyond human technology. They have been traveling among the stars for thousands of years and have learned how to create realistic 3D holographic projections that allow them to masquerade as anything they choose. She said she had a small holographic projector implanted in her chest that she controlled with her thoughts. When humans see her as Amanda, they're actually viewing her very lifelike human disguise, an illusion complete with all of the physical attributes of a homo sapien. Her disguise was so sophisticated that no human could detect her true identity. She said that living among humans allows them to get an intimate perspective on what makes us tick, so they can understand what motivates humans and what triggers their negative emotions. Toxic emotions like fear, anger, and hate are endemic to humans on Earth, and they are trying to determine the cause so they can find a way to suppress these feelings. They are doing this to help our civilization curb its abusive behavior before we end up destroying ourselves. This is why she teaches at the medical school in Oxford, because it allows her to explore the workings of the human brain as part of her research without raising suspicions from the other staff. She advised that there are many others from her race who are engaged in similar activities throughout our planet. And she sincerely hoped that they would find a solution for us before it is too late. She then morphed back into her Amanda disguise and returned to the hospital. And then to reinforce the point that ETs have been affecting us in subtle ways during the history of our planet, Albert took me to the Akashic records, which contain the records of every life that has ever been lived anywhere in the universe. And there I got to view scenes from my previous lives where I had a close encounter with an ET. It was a scene from my past life as a Druid priest living on the Salisbury Plain in England around 3000 BC. I watched as a starship landed nearby, manned by an eight foot human named Mogans, who came from a civilization living on a planet in the Andromeda constellation. Mogans enlisted my help to organize the villagers to build a cosmic beacon he needed 
to provide navigational assistance for ships in warp drive. With the aid of laser cutting tools and anti-gravity wands supplied by Mogons, special stones were queried and transported to the plane to build the structure now known as Stonehenge. When all the stones were in place in accordance with the detailed plans supplied by Mogons, he placed the power box in the center of the structure and left in his spaceship. Years later, he returned unnoticed to retrieve the power box when the beacon was no longer needed. The natives never discovered the true purpose for Stonehenge, and for many years, they used it for religious ceremonies. Well, that certainly explained how those massive stones were cut and transported over many miles by primitive humans. There is just nothing like a little help from our friends who travel between the stars. Albert then provided another example of how ETs have helped life on Earth in subtle ways. He told me that eons ago, another moon larger than our moon circled Earth in a higher orbit. He said it was truly a stunning display from Earth when both moons filled the night sky. The larger moon had an atmosphere and climate very similar to Earth, with many different life forms that thrived in this congenial habitat, including a species of large flightless birds, several different types of small mammals, and a variety of insects. It was a nicely balanced ecosystem where all the inhabitants enjoyed the freedom to live without interference from a more advanced race. But then, long before recorded history on Earth, disaster struck when a large comet smashed into this moon, knocking it towards away from the sun. The collision triggered a series of severe earthquakes and volcanic eruptions that caused it to break into pieces. Several of the chunks crashed into Mars and Jupiter, but the bulk of them ended up in an orbit around the sun in what we now call the asteroid belt. Just before the collision, one of the ET races that had been monitoring activity on Earth loaded their spacecraft with a few specimens of each of the life forms and flew them to safety on Earth. They landed in an area now known as Australia when it was still part of the supercontinent of Gondwana. The rescued creatures were left there to make a life for themselves in a place that resembled their old home in many respects. The large birds, now known as emus, thrived in their new home, as did many of the small animals still living to today in Australia, but nowhere else. These mammals were mainly marsupials, including kangaroos, wallabies, koalas, and opossums, as well as mammals that lay eggs, like the duck-billed platypus and the spiny anteater. When I asked Albert why the ETs didn't use their superior technology to prevent the collision that broke up the other moon, Albert said that the ETs were bound by the directive of the Galactic Council that stopped them from interfering with the normal course of cosmic events. But they were allowed to rescue the life form from the doomed moon and relocate it to Earth. They chose Australia as the new home for these creatures, partly because Australia had a climate that was similar to the moon where they came from, but mainly because it was home to Uluru, previously known as Ayers Rock, which is the famous sandstone monolith in the Northern Territory's central desert. The ETs unloaded their precious cargo close to Uluru, so these creatures would be able to easily connect with Gaia as part of their orientation to planet Earth. Albert pointed out that Uluru was, and still is, one of Gaia's communication beacons that transmits sublimable messages to her fauna by the modulation of energy waves passing through the rock. Creatures who tune in to these ethereal vibrations feel an intimate connection to Mother Earth, and the ETs hoped that this would, would enable their transplanted creatures to become comfortable in their new surroundings. A few humans who visit Uluru sense there is something special about this monolith, 
and the Aboriginal people who have lived near the, this rock for centuries have a unique spiritual connection with this massive block of sandstone, which they regard as a sacred site. Albert said, it is a pity that all humans aren't able to perceive the true nature of this beacon and feel the love and compassion Gaia showers on all of her creatures. Maybe then humankind would change its ways and treat one another and all the other inhabitants of our beautiful planet with dignity and respect. So then Albert decided to reveal some significant ET encounters in more recent times. And he took me to the Akashic records to view what happened when an ET spacecraft crashed into the desert near Roswell, New Mexico in 1947. The scene that was shown in the Akashic records was a remote location near Roswell. I watched with fascination as a flying disc crashed into the desert. Inside the spacecraft, I saw three little humanoid aliens seated in the cockpit. One of the aliens was still alive when military personnel arrived on the scene, and it was taken along with the spacecraft to Roswell Army Airfield. The doctors at the airfield tried their best to save the little alien, but they were unable to keep him alive. All the alien bodies and their spacecraft eventually ended up in Area 51 in Nevada, where they are today. Albert explained that these ETs came from the planet Gorgon in the Pisces constellation to observe human life on Earth. An equipment malfunction had caused them to collide with a high altitude surveillance balloon and they crashed into the desert below. Before he died, the lone survivor drew a picture of a dove holding an olive branch in its beak, the ancient sign for peace. Well, as you know, the US military denied the existence of the spacecraft and its alien occupants as part of the UF cover-up that has been going on for decades. Well, that certainly confirmed what many people have believed all along about the Roswell incident. And I expect that someday the US authorities will admit to the facts. But in the meantime, the cover-up will ensure that the truth remains locked up in a cavern under Area 51. By now, it was obvious to me that ET races were everywhere in our galaxy, but I was curious about other human civilizations. The Stonehenge ET was a human, but I wondered if there were other human civilizations in the Milky Way. Albert assured me that there were other human civilizations thriving in our galaxy, some of which were much more advanced than humans on Earth. And he took me on an astral trip to see a couple of them firsthand. He guided me on a trip to a planet called Thrasyl, many light years from Earth. After we touched down on the surface, I noticed that this planet was a very advanced human civilization with ultra modern cities, flying cars and moving walkways. In the Imperial Palace, we met with Empress Marpesia who had been elected as the supreme leader of the planet by the popular vote of the women in their society. Marpesi explained that they enjoyed a matriarchal society ruled solely by women and men were not allowed to vote or hold any position of power or authority. The men were all docile and submissive because of their low testosterone levels, which resulted from the chemical sterilization of all males at the age of three. But Marpesia asserted that these men were not subjugated or treated harshly, as they were free to pursue sports and recreational activities and just enjoy life. They did not miss their sex drive because they never remembered having it. There was no crime or conflicts in their society, as the women were always able to reconcile their differences peacefully and the men caused no problems because they were always deferential and compliant. Women and men did not form partnerships or have sex, and their babies were artificially incubated using sperm from a sperm bank that was supplied by a few chosen males who were not sterilized. Marpesi explained that long ago, they had been a patriarchal society 
where the women had been subjugated by violent and aggressive men. But that had all changed a long time ago when a woman discovered a plant in the forest that drastically reduced the testosterone level in men, and they have lived in peaceful harmony ever since. Well, that is certainly one way to run a planet, although I wondered if there wasn't something, some happy middle ground between the extremes of this matriarchal society and the male-dominated world on my own planet. It would be wonderful if we could achieve true equality in all respects for the men and women on our planet, even though we will always have some inherent differences due to our propensity to be influenced by either left brain or right brain thinking. An example of the cognitive differences between men and women came to light recently when I noticed a humorous post on Facebook. It obviously came from a man who felt that his wife was nagging him too much about fixing things around the house. The post said, when a man says he will do something, he will do it. And there's no need to remind him every six months. Well, as we left Thrasso and its matriarchal society, I asked Albert if this civilization had ever visited our planet. He told me they had not done so because they did not yet have the ability to travel between the stars. Thank God, I said to myself. I was afraid I'd have to rush back to Earth to warn the men, lest we all ended up singing like the Vienna Boys Choir. Fortunately for me, my next trip with Albert took me to a utopian human civilization living on the planet Gamma, many light years from Earth, where men and women were in fact equal in every respect. As we descended toward the surface of Gamma, Albert told me it was home to a super intelligent race of humans who had developed very advanced technology, including spacecraft that could travel between the stars. He wanted me to see another example of a human civilization that had managed to thrive by overcoming the destructive tendencies in humans that have plagued our civilization on Earth over the ages. The citizens looked like humans on Earth with a variety of hair colors and skin tones. They appeared to be healthy, happy, as they chatted amiably as they went about their business. Then Albert introduced me to one of their citizens, a woman named Jophiel. She confirmed that they are humans, just like the ones on planet Earth, except their civilization is very different from ours on Earth. Her civilization was at the same stage as Earth's e eons ago, but they had managed to struggle through their challenges, and now they thrive in a peaceful and happy society. In the early days of their civilization, they were brutal and aggressive like the people on Earth, and they suffered through many wars and savage conflicts. Then their scientists discovered that the cruel and aggressive people suffered from a common defective gene, and they were able to gradually rid their population of this affliction through genetic engineering and selective breeding. Now they have no violence or crime, and they live their lives in peaceful harmony with one another, and men and women are equal in all respects. And because their technology is very advanced, they enjoy everything they need for a happy and fulfilled life, all courtesy of their society, which supplies all the food, shelter, recreation, and entertainment that they require. Their people don't have to work for a living and they have no need for money. Their education is provided for by their society and their people are free to pursue their interests in one of the many career paths available on the planet. Joe Field says they all cheerfully pitch in to support their society to the best of their abilities, but there is no hierarchy or pecking order. They are all equal citizens on their planet and no one gets special treatment. As a result, there is no jealousy, greed, or competition among their people and crime is non-existent. All the people in the city were robust, fit, and healthy. This was a result of their genetic engineering which eliminated all the genes that previously made them susceptible to disease, physical handicaps, and the natural aging process. So now they can live for hundreds of years without any physical deterioration to their bodies. In fact, 
unless they perish in a natural accident on their planet or while exploring the galaxy, they die when they feel it is time to move on by entering special departure chambers that vaporize their bodies and allow their souls to return to spirit. All their people were perfectly proportioned with no ex excess bad body fat, thanks to a miracle pill developed years ago. This pill allowed them to consume as much food as they like without any concerns about calories or cholesterol. Although they could provide healthy sustenance for their citizens in the form of liquid food, they learned long ago that they truly eating, they enjoy eating a variety of tasty food dishes. So they manufacture food without killing any of the animals on their planet that is very similar to the food that used to make from animal flesh. And by ingesting the diet pill, they can eat whatever they want without gaining any weight. They have hundreds of restaurants in the city and they gather nightly to eat and drink to their heart's content. Well, this certainly sounded to me like an idyllic society. And I wondered if our civilization on earth could reach these lofty heights before we crashed and burned. Albert said it was doable, but it would take a concerted effort by all humans to create this paradise on earth. Well, my trip to Gamma gave me new hope that one day our human civilization could create its own utopia. And I strongly feel that we can achieve this if we all pull together. By now you must be thinking that all of my astral trips with Albert were exciting and awe-inspiring. But I want to tell you about one of these excursions that was hellish and frightening when Albert took me to the center of a black hole. As you know, astronomers tell us that black holes are usually formed when a star collapses on itself, leaving a core of extremely dense matter that has such a strong gravitational pull that not, nothing, not even light, can escape from its clutches. I was not sure why Albert took me there, and as I submerged down into the core of this black hole, I experienced something I had never before encountered total sensory deprivation, and total isolation. I could not see, hear, or feel anything. I was enveloped in absolute blackness, and I had no sense of passing time. Albert had seemingly disappeared, and I was all alone in this terrifying pit of darkness and despair, with no way to escape. I felt the panic welling up in my chest as I began to think that I was in hell, that I might be stuck in this accursed never world forever. And then to my relief, I noticed a tiny print prick of light in the distance. The light got bigger as it approached and soon it engulfed me and shut out the darkness. I found myself in a strange world that reminded me of the diagram of an atom I had studied in school. There was a round mass in the center of a globe with sparks of light revolving around it, much like the nucleus of an atom surrounded by orbiting electrons. Soon an invisible force caused me to zoom away from this atom, and I noticed other atoms had come together with it to form a molecule. As I continued to zoom away, I could see that this molecule had combined with other similar molecules to form a shiny black substance that sparkled in the light. Then I found myself slowly emerging from the glass eye of a teddy bear sitting on a shelf in my family room. I noticed Albert was now standing beside me, grinning from ear to ear. As he assured me, he had been with me all along and I had spent less than 30 seconds of earth time in the black hole. He told me he had deliberately concealed his presence so I could experience the sadness of being all alone. When I asked him how I had managed to get back into my home, he told me that the space-time continuum is curved in many different ways, and I had returned to an interdimensional wormhole. Albert wanted me to understand that you can't truly appreciate the light until you have experienced total darkness. And he was right. After my trip to the black hole, I realized how fortunate I was to be able to see and truly appreciate 
the splendor of the sunrise, the breathtaking beauty of the flowers in my garden, and the majesty of the sequoia tree towering above our house. And then to cheer me up after my terrifying trip to the black hole, Albert took me to visit Earth in a higher dimension, often referred to as the new Earth or 5D Earth. We passed through an interdimensional doorway to reach the new Earth, which exists simultaneously with our Earth, but at a much higher vibration rate. There I met with the descendants of a human civilization that had originally lived in Central America on the old Earth. The civilization had been living in peaceful, peace and harmony until they discovered a race of barbarian humans encroaching on their territory. And when this happens, their leaders orchestrated a mass ascension to the new earth where they now live once again in peace and harmony. The citizens of the new earth are not plagued by the negative emotions that are rampant on the old earth. As a result, they have no violence or crime. They live in total harmony with their planet and its other creatures. They do not consume animal flesh and eat only liquid nourishment made from plants. They have learned to shield themselves from disease, to repair injured tissue, and to slow down the aging process, so they live for several hundred years. They do not have to work and they have no need for money, and they don't need to accumulate material goods. Everything they need is provided for by their society. This is truly an idyllic society that we should all aspire to reach. Well, the new earth was an amazing place indeed. So I asked Albert how someone on the old earth could ascend to the new earth. Albert told me that on many occasions, humans on the old earth have made the ascension to the new earth by raising their vibrations to match the vibration rate of the new earth. Humans can raise their vibrations by fully embracing love, compassion, and forgiveness and stifling all of their negative emotions. It was apparent to me after learning about the new earth that our universe consists of countless dimensions having different vibration rates. But I wondered if there were any parallel dimensions or universes with similar vibration rates to our earth. Albert confirmed that parallel universes do exist and they have been around since the beginning of time. When the source created the first universe in what some scientists call the Big Bang, it wanted to experience what it had created in all of its facets without guidance or interference. So the universe began as an explosion of pure energy that eventually congealed into many different patterns and formations. It was created with a built-in randomness factor to ensure that the ongoing permutations would be limitless. The first universe followed its divine destiny and eventually split into two universes, similar to the way a cell in a human body splits into two in the process called mitosis. Although the two universes were identical at first, they soon began to develop on different paths due to the random interaction of their energy and matter. And then at different times in the cosmic cycle, each of these two universes split into two and so on until now we have countless universes that were all originally spawned from the source. No two universes are identical, while some of them have much in common, while others are radically different. The differences arose initially due to the small random variations in their flow of energy and the formation of matter. And later subtler distinctions resulted from the free will actions of the various life forms that populated the planets. In some universes, the earth does not even exist due to a quirk in the formation of the solar system. And in others, our planet is radically different from the world as we know it. For example, in one parallel universe, the asteroid that crashed into the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago, killing most of the dinosaurs, missed that Earth by a whisker, and dinosaurs are still the dominant species of that planet. All these universes exist simultaneously in different dimensions, but most life forms, including humans on Earth, 
cannot detect their presence except in very rare cases. This brings to mind the so-called Mandela effect, a concept that many of you are familiar with. The term was coined by a paranormal researcher who discovered that a significant number of participants at a conference in South Africa all had the same memory of media reports that Nelson Mandela had died in prison in the 1980s in stark contrast with the fact that he had been released from prison in 1990 and went on to become president of that country. A number of explanations have been advanced for this phenomena, but the reality, according to Albert, is that these people had a glimpse in, of Earth in a parallel universe where the events they remember about Mandela were actually true. Albert says that sometimes windows to other dimensions will temporarily open up allowing some people to view the events in another dimension that often have significant differences from our own dimension. And to make his point, Albert took me on an astral trip to visit Earth in another dimension. He led me through an interdimensional doorway floating in space. On the other side, we hovered momentarily above a blue orb that looked like Earth before we plunged down through the clouds on our way to New York City. When we landed in lower Manhattan, I was surprised to see the World Trade Towers standing intact, just as I remembered them from one of my visits to the city prior to September 11, 2001. Albert explained that this was the same year in this universe as in our world, and the World Trade Towers were still standing because they had not been destroyed by a terrorist attack in 2001 due to the fact that there were no Islamic terrorists anywhere in this world. In fact, Islam as a religion did not exist anywhere on this planet, and this is because Muhammad died at an early age before he was able to engender the religion that plays a major part in world affairs on our earth. As a result, the Middle Eastern countries you know, on this planet were mostly Christian, and there were no jihadists anywhere. He pointed out a number of significant differences that arose from this one seminal event. The Crusades did not happen because the Holy Land was occupied by Christians, not infidels. The state of Israel did not exist and the territory occupied by Israel, Lebanon and Syria and the Sinai Peninsula in our world comprised the country of Palestine in this world, which is populated by Jews and Christian Arabs who live in peaceful coexistence. And then to demonstrate another significant difference, Albert took me to the heart of Harlem. When I asked him why there were so, so few African Americans on the streets, he said it resulted from another noteworthy event on this planet that never happened on our earth. Early in the 16th century, England abolished slavery and the rest of Europe soon followed suit. And because the colonies in North America were governed by England and other European nations, Slavery was also abolished in the New World. This meant that no slaves were captured in Africa and transported to America. As a result, African Americans who immigrated here in a normal course represented less than 1% of the population of the United States rather than the 13% in our world, and they were scattered over the whole country. President Lincoln did not issue the Emancipation Proclamation because there were no slaves to free and the Civil War never happened. Those, my friends, were a few highlights from my astral journeys with Albert. Time does not permit me to discuss all of these trips, but the details are set in full in my books. All my books are available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook formats. They can be purchased from my publisher all the online bookstores and many bricks and mortar stores. Convenient buy links can be find, found on my website, which is garnetshowhalzer.com. Well, that wraps up my presentation today. I will be available for the next half hour for questions that you can access under the sessions tab. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you very much, Garnet. Uh, what an amazing journey. Uh, you've had it's just fantastic. Um, quite a bit different from your law practice, I would imagine. 
Yes, indeed. <laughs> Quite a bit different. <laughs> um, hopefully, at least it sounded like a little bit more fun. <laughs> Most of the trips were fun, yeah, and, and and I learned a lot, and it really changed my life for us, so I'm, I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, well, I can imagine. I can only imagine. All right, well, let's go to the sessions tab, everybody, to start the question and answer with Garnet. So click on sessions and um, um, Garnet, click on sessions, click on your banner also, and uh, um, and that'll take you into the same space for the Q&A. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. On the side here, um, Anna wants to know, how did you become a QHHT practitioner? Uh, interesting story. I, I had uh, all of my books have been published by Ozark Mountain Publishing, uh, which was, of course, founded by Dolores Cannon. Um, and uh, so I was vaguely aware of Dolores's QHHT program. And after I finished the manuscript for my fourth book, I asked Albert, what should I do now? Should I start writing book five or what? Albert said, put book five on hold for now. And I want you to take the QHHT program, which I did. And that's how I got into the QHHT. Next question. Okay. Um, well, that kind of answered Bettina because Albert is still visiting you because you are coming out with another book. Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, my fifth book. Eventually, uh, Albert said I should get on with book five, and he took me on another series of uh, astral trips. Um, and um, so that resulted in the, the manuscript for my fifth book, which is entitled Dancing with Angels in Heaven. And that's in the process of being published. Uh, I'm not quite sure when it will be released, but sometime, hopefully either later this year or early in 22. Uh, Jonathan wanted to know how easy was it for you to learn to astral travel? Well, it was really quite easy because I didn't really do anything. I didn't, it was nothing that I did. It was Albert doing everything. He just showed up in my, in my bedroom uh, one night, as I said, and he just, he literally reached in and grabbed my astral hand pulled my astral body out of my physical body and away we went. And so I didn't really have to do anything. He did everything. And, and every time I took a trip with him, the same thing happened. And after the trip was over, he would bring me back to my bedroom and I would slip back into my physical body. Next morning I would wake up and I would vividly remember everything that I'd experienced. So I'd immediately go to the computer and start keyboarding in everything I remembered so I could uh, use it later for the basis for a manuscript for one of my books. Oh, hey, Garnet. Hi, Rose. How are you? Good. How are you? Pretty good. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to maybe ask that question that I, I asked you in Messenger. Maybe this might be beneficial for somebody else. I did ask you about the vaccination shot. Did you want to make a suggestion with that with others that might be beneficial for anyone who's listening? Yeah, I've had um, a couple of conversations with Albert about that. Uh, we didn't go into great detail, but he did say that the vaccinations are good. Everyone who has it available should take it because that's really the best way to shut down this pandemic and get us back to normal life. So his recommendation is take them. They're good for us. And that's the way to get, get us out of the pandemic lockdown. So uh, another person wanted to know, why do you think you were selected by Albert? Well, I've asked Albert that question. He said that he and I planned it all before I incarnated. Because as you know, before each of us comes to planet Earth, we, we plan our life ahead that we want to experience on Earth. We do a life plan. So during the course of that, and after I chose Albert to be one of my spirit guides, um, he said that here's the plan, that, that uh, at, at an appropriate time, he would show up in my life. Um, and that uh, from there, he would we'd have a dialogue, we'd go on astral trips, and I'd write books. And of course, after I was born, I don't remember any of that, but he assured me that this had all been pre-planned and that fortunately it went according to plan and I've done everything that he had hoped that I would do so far anyway. Okay, uh, I believe his name is Leaf. He wants to know how you communicate with Albert now. Is it through medica uh, meditation or dreams or ad astral projection? Uh, generally, um, when we're not on an astral trip, generally if I'm gonna talk to him, I'll sit quietly in a room and meditate, and then I'll sort of uh, say, hello, Albert, are you there? Of course, he always is, and so we can have a, a conversation. So I don't speak to him every day, uh, just when I have something I want to ask him. Um, sometimes he'll contact me when he wants to tell me something. Uh, but when we're on astral trips, it's just, it's just by telepathy, uh, and, and, we have a, and we can converse just like you and I are conversing right now, Dolly. Hi, can you hear, Hi, me? Can you hear me? Yes, Catherine, how are you? I'm good, how are you? 
are you? Pretty good, thank you. I was wondering if um, after you traveled to the planet where those animals were talking to you, if that changed how you saw animals on this planet and uh, your relationship to maybe eating them or not eating them anymore. Uh, yeah, it certainly changed my view of, of animals. I truly understood after <clears throat> visiting Proteus, excuse me, and uh, talking to shimmers, and I've talked to a few other creatures on, on planet Earth, you realize that, that all animals, no matter whether they're on planet Earth or on a different planet, they all have souls just like we do. They're all sensitive beings that have feelings and emotions. And that really brought home to me the fact that um, we need everyone, all humans, need to treat animals with dignity and respect. And so I've been really trying hard to do that. Um, and I, I really do think that, that humans should curtail uh, eating animal flesh. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to quite get there yet, but I am trying. But to the extent that, it, that other people can become vegetarian or vegan and stop eating animal flesh, I think that's a good thing. But there's other ways we can stop abuse. We can stop sport hunting. We can stop trapping and hunting you know, whales and other creatures. And there's so many things we can do to better treat our animals on Earth. And I think we should all do that. Uh, Pete, uh, Pete, you know, have you ever encountered humans from Earth living in any other planet? She had heard that some humans have got the opportunity to move to an, or on another planet. Um, the only place I've encountered uh, humans from Earth is on the new Earth, which is, uh, you know, at a higher vibration. So there's lots of humans from old Earth who have made the ascension up to the new Earth. So, so that's a different planet. I haven't encountered other humans from Earth in the other uh, planets, although I've encountered, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, uh, human civilizations on other planets. I don't know whether they originated from Earth or whether they originate from somewhere else. I'm not sure the timing of that. But certainly there have been humans from our planet that have made the ascension to the new earth. Lance wants to know, how is humanity doing now? I'm sorry, how is who doing now? Humanity. How is humanity now? How are we how, doing currently? How, how are we doing on earth right now? Well, as I mentioned, we're at a very crucial point in our development. And uh, we're sort of at a point where if we, if we go one way, we'll end up uh, destroying ourselves and all other life on the planet. Or if we go another way, we'll move up the vibratory ladder and make our planet a better place to live. And all that turns on people being able to raise their vibrations by embracing love, compassion, and forgiveness and discarding our negative emotions. And if we can do that, we'll make our, our world a much better place. And, and when I ask Albert, well, is this going to happen? He won't say for sure, but he's very optimistic that we can make the change and that we will survive and that eventually most of us will make the ascension to the new earth, which is really where we should be. Uh, Jessica wants to know, do you have a soul group you have connected with or just Albert? Um, yeah, I do have a soul group and I've met Albert. I've met one of my other spirit guides on the spirit side. Uh, I have not been introduced to the rest of my soul group, but I know from what Albert tells me is that we all travel in soul groups and that uh, when, you know during our journeys on earth and that we will, uh, change places from time to time as we journey through many different lives so that um, a member of your soul group in one life might be your father another time might be your daughter or your son or your uncle and we keep on switching these roles around traveling together as a group and we do this to support each other so that everyone in the soul group can can uh, advance and evolve in accordance with uh, the the journey that they have mapped out for themselves so um so i hope that when i do officially and finally cross over to the spirit side i'm certain i will I will meet the other members of my soul group. But for now, I'm, I'm comforted to know that I am a member of one, and I know two of them for sure, Albert and Alina, who are my spirit guides. Well, hey, Garnet. I just wanted to, um, I, I'm sorry, because I walked away for a second, so I don't know if you shared this. I, I, one of the interviews you just did recently in the past few months was about um, Mother Earth creating the pandemic. Did you, um, did you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, in one of my uh, recent conversations with Gaia, and I did ask her about the pandemic, um, and she said, well, it's just part of a, of, of a natural sort of cleansing process that, that Mother Earth goes through from time to time, particularly with respect to humans. And, and it's, it's done in, in order for humans effectively to sort of stop uh, and reset. And because right now we're sort of off on our own tangent, 
and 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 so she basically she unleashed the pandemic because she wanted us to uh, stop and consider who we are and where we are and what we're doing to our planet during the lockdown. And it's very uh, noticeable that during the lock, especially in the early lockdown last year, um, people noticed that there was no smog above LA. Uh, people in Venice said they could see dolphins swimming in the canals for the first time because the water was so clear. Um, and uh, in, in Cairo said that for the first time in ages, they could actually see the pyramids from their city. This is all because the pollution in our atmosphere had been drastically reduced because people weren't burning fossil fuels, commuting to work or flying in airplanes. And, and so many things had been shut down that all of a sudden we got a clearer vision of our planet. And so she wanted us to see that. And she's hoping that because of the lockdown, working from home, that after the lockdown is lifted, she's hoping that there'll be fewer and fewer people who will uh, commute to work and that more and more will work from home. And this is all good for planet Earth. It'll lessen pollution and it just will help us make aware of the fact that the planet is so much healthier and happier if we don't cause so much pollution. So she did unleash this. She's done it before. She did the, the Black Plague uh, centuries ago. She did the Spanish flu. Now this is her third attempt. And, and it's not her intention to be cruel to humans or to wipe out a bunch of humans. Um, but she just wanted us to have a reset on where we are and how we relate to our planet. Uh, Gwen was wanting to know, have you been told about an imminent ascension uh, that is the split between the old and the new earth, a time given? Um, yeah, I've been told, and I found out from the higher self in some of my QHHT sessions that, that there is a, a, a wave of energy that is hitting us right now and it's going to increase and, and the whole intent of that is to make the, is, is to enable the people who are spiritually enlightened to enable them to be able to raise their vibrations so they can in fact ascend to the new earth. And that's happening. There's supposed to be an increase sometime in the next two years, a new wave of energy coming. Um, and so a number of us are gonna ascend up to the new earth and, and that, which is a great thing. Unfortunately, all of the people on earth aren't gonna make the ascension. And that's just because they're not ready to sort of become enlightened and they're too mired in negative emotions. So some of us will ascend, the rest won't. Um, and then um, the ones who are still here will of course perish in a normal course. The souls will go back to the spirit side. And from there they can decide, do they want to reincarnate back into old earth or incarnate into the new earth? It'll be their choice. Uh, Diane wants to know, what has been your favorite or most profound place to visit? Um, I, well, the spirit side generally. I mean, I, I visited a number of planets which were really quite amazing, like the, the, the utopian one in, uh, in Gamma and the, the matriarchal society and so on. Spirit side is really our true home. That is where um, we are beings of energy. And then the spirit side is so wonderful because there's no negative emotions, there's no pain or suffering. We're not physical, we're energy beings. We don't have to eat, drink or sleep or procreate. Um, and there's nothing but unconditional love. And it's just such an amazing place. And it's like, uh, compared to earth, it's really heaven, paradise, utopia, however you wanna say it. And the good news is that every one of us, when our bodies perish, our souls will return to the spirit side. And there we can decide to stay there for as long as we want. We can decide to reincarnate again on planet Earth or on another planet. Uh, so it's really our choice. And, and uh, we're, we really came here to learn and experience things that we needed for our growth and evolution. But there's, no, there's just nothing comparable to the spirit side. And I uh, implore all of you to understand that that good place will be coming to all of us when our bodies die and no one should fear death. Uh, Pia wants to know, has Albert talked to you about the 5G? About the 5G? Yes. Yeah, no, he has, he has not, uh, we have not discussed that at all. Okay. Um, Jessica says, how can we overcome the stigma around these topics, especially in professional careers? It seems we have a, to study in secret or face ridicule, unlike traditional religions, which are embraced as normal. I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Dolly? I didn't quite catch that. Yeah, sorry. Maybe I need to get closer to the mic. Um, how can we overcome the stigma around these topics, especially in professional careers? 
it seems we have to study in secret or face ridicule. Unlike traditional religions, which are embraced as normal. Well, that's that's an issue that that all of us face, and certainly uh, it, it, it faced. I faced it when I was uh, uh, when I first met Albert. I mean, I was a a, a stuffed shirt, a button down corporate lawyer who didn't talk about spirituality or religion. I didn't know anything much about spirituality until after I met Albert. So after I wrote my first book, I thought, uh oh, if I publish this, many of my former partners and clients and colleagues are going to think I've lost my mind. And so I was very hesitant about what they might think. And then after I just realized that, look, I have to do this. And so let the chips fall where they may. And uh, if I lose some friends along the way, so be it. But I've gained, and in fact, I have, some of my former partners don't speak to me anymore. Um, and uh, But I've made many new friends who are spiritually aware. So what I do, and I recognize the stigma. So what I do is that I, I don't raise the topic when I'm meeting new people or even friends that aren't aware of what I do. And just because I know that in the past experience that if I start talking about it, some people will roll their eyes and just walk away. And I, I don't need that in my life. And so if people want to really get into it, I will get into it. Otherwise, I just sort of uh, leave it as is. And I broadcast my message through my books and through radio shows and, and presentations. So there is a stigma. How do you overcome it? I, I think just be very patient and uh, don't sort of put it out there. I mean, because you're going to be faced with a lot of rolling eyes. Don't put it out there. But if you detect somebody who is who is susceptible to the uh, to the spiritual message, then you could just quietly speak to them and and, uh, and let it be known. But it's not going to be good for your career if you just come out right and start talking about it. I know that if I was still practicing law, there's no way I could have written my books or talked about spirituality. So you have to tread carefully. But eventually, as more and more people become spiritually aware, it would be easier for you to talk about it. Uh, King wants to know, can you tell us about some of the celebrities you have met on your travels? Uh, you had mentioned meeting Robin Williams. Do they have any messages for us? Yeah, I met Robin Williams. Uh, he's very kind and compassionate soul. Uh, and he basically, his message basically was that he had spiraled down into the depths of despair. Um, he had had a problem with uh, alcohol and drugs. Um, so he had struggled through that. And then what, uh, and then the, uh, his agent was trying to get him to do another Doubtfire movie, which he didn't really want to do. So that sort of put him down. But he was experiencing some money problems, which may be strange because you think he made a lot of money, but I guess he spent a lot. And then the final straw was when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And that sort of put him right down and he committed suicide. Back in the spirit side, he realized that committing suicide was a mistake and that he should have worked through his problems. His advice to everyone is that if you're feeling really depressed and have suicidal thoughts, talk to your friends and family, talk to medical professions. Do not be embarrassed about having suicidal thoughts because it's common to a lot of people. And if you talk to other people, they can help you work through it. And so he said, whatever you do, work through your problems and do not commit suicide. Hi, Garnett. It's Brandy. Hi, Brandy. Nice to see your smiling face. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have another question from Benice. Did you have any conversations with Albert about the Atlantis and the uh, Egyptian civilization? No, just briefly. He, Albert mentioned that, that uh, as, as many humans have already discovered, that Atlantis was a very advanced civilization that rose up to great heights and then it just crashed and burned. Um, and he said it was Atlantis, Lemuria, and some of the other ones uh, that they mainly collapsed due to uh, uh, greed and power seeking humans who misused their technology and, and that caused their collapse. And, and, and aside from that, he didn't really say anything more uh, other than after each of these civilizations collapsed, the, 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 the humans who had escaped the disaster because they were elsewhere, they basically had to start over. So our civilization on Earth has had many ups and downs. Um, and, uh, and, and Atlantis was certainly one of them. He did not mention the Egyptian connection, um, uh, so I can't speak to that. Oh, hey, Garnet. Um, I just want to ask both. I just want to ask one more question. I don't know if I'm echoing. Am I echoing? Anyway, I just wanted to ask, has anyone tried to get a hold of your information and make a TV series out of it? I keep praying for that, Garnet. 
<laughs> I'm serious. I can just picture these wonderful s scenes, you know, like that. Has anyone pursued you yet? We got to pray for that, guys. No one has. I'd be delighted to have my books made into a TV series or a movie. Uh, when I mentioned it to Albert, he says, oh, forget about it. He says, you're too ugly to be in a movie. So we'd have, they have to pick, obviously, somebody else. So I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed, and I'll, I'll certainly publish that on my website if it ever happens, Rose. All right, Garnet, we have one from Fern. It says, are there infinite number of souls? Um, that I don't know. I know that new souls are, there's lots of souls in the universe. New souls are constantly being spun out from the, from the source, like sparks of light from the central sun. So I don't know if it's infinite. It's a large number. Uh, there's certainly no shortage of souls. There's many to, lots of souls to go around for all the bodies, humans or otherwise on planet earth. Um, and so I don't know, but there's a, there's a, a great number of souls in the universe and new ones are being created every day. Hey, we have a question from Damien. It says, will we remember any history from the old earth if you are on the new earth or will that not exist? Oh yes, you will remember the history for sure. Like uh, the people on new earth will retain their memories of, uh, of the old earth. Uh, they can actually see what's going on in the old earth through their, uh, uh, through their viewing technology. Um, and so, yeah, they, they will remember. And, and, and the people on the new earth will of course be looking back at us and they'll be saying, my God, I wish more humans could make the ascension uh, because it's good for, for everyone on the old earth. And they understand that there's still a lot of violence and conflicts and wars and genocide on the old earth because of the negative emotions. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because uh, on, on one of my trips to the spirit side, I had an encounter with a, a, a woman who had been on the old earth. She had made the ascension to the new earth. And then eventually she, her soul left the body there and came back to the spirit side. And I said to her, on your next incarnation, are you going to go back to someone on the new earth? And she says, no, because there aren't many challenges on the new earth. Everything is so nice there. She was going to reincarnate to a human on the old earth so she could help the humans on the old earth make the ascension. So I think that's, uh, so they're very aware of what's going on in the, the old earth. And they really want to help us in every way that they can. Great. Okay. Uh Lance, would you possibly just answer this? Is there new technology that you know of to help humanity? Um, nothing that Albert has disclosed to me. Uh, he has told me that eventually uh, humans will, uh, will, will figure out how to make a warp drive to travel between the stars uh, and that we will uh, develop all kinds of other things. Uh, you know, the, um, when I had a conversation with uh, Albert Einstein on the spirit side, and one of his struggles was to find a, a, a unifying field theory where he could unify all the forces of nature into one theory, which he didn't do on Earth. And back there, he says, oh, yeah, it's very simple. And when I said to him, why can't you tell uh, the scientists on Earth uh, what you've discovered? And he said, well, I, we can't do that. We can't give people on Earth a silver bullet to get rid of all their problems or solve all of their, uh, all of their enigmas. Uh, but he said, eventually, we'll, we'll get there. And so... The future for us, as long as we can stay on this planet without destroying all life here, is that we will eventually get there with the help of people on the spirit side and some of the ETs who do send us telepathic inspirational messages uh, uh, to, to try to help us uh, um, make a quantum leap in our technology. They've been doing this over time. They will continue to do that, but they aren't going to give it to us all at once on a silver platter. So we have to struggle through those things and, and figure it out ourselves. Okay, now we have a question from Lorna. Have you ever encountered any angelic beings on your journey with Albert? Absolutely. In fact, I met one of my guardian angels who, uh, who, whose name was Anna Peel. And I met with her and had a nice discussion with her. And she told me about uh, uh, the function of guardian angels. Their function basically is to protect, watch over people on earth and protect them from unforeseen accidents or other things, traumas that might uh, cause a ph grave physical harm or death before our souls are ready to leave. So that was the guardian angel function. But I've also met with others. I've met with Archangel Michael, Archangel Ariel, um, and um, also Lucifer, who's actually a beneficial agent, uh, angel rather. He's not, he's, not a, he's not the devil. He's actually a beneficial angel. So I've met with a few of them, and they're all very special souls created by the source 
whose function is to help people on earth that usually don't incarnate in human bodies, uh, but they're there and they're there to help us. And if they need to, in order to help us avoid a tragic accident, they can actually uh, manifest in physical form to help us out. So they're there, there's lots of them, and they're really there to help us on our journey and to make sure that uh, we can live our lives in accordance with our life plan as our souls have planned before we incarnated. Okay, are you good for a few more questions or? Yeah, I could take, uh, let's, let's do three more. Okay, we have a question from Roxanne. It says, how are souls created? Souls are created by the source. And, and as I said, it's, it's a, the analogy is it's like a, a sparks of light spinning out from a central sun. And so the source creates souls. Souls are really individual aspects of the source. And, and the souls spin out from the source and, they're, and they're, their goal is to explore the universe, explore all the galaxies, explore the planets. Um, if they choose to, they can incarnate into physical forms, um, but they don't have to. And the, the, the reason the source creates souls is that because everything that a soul experiences on its journeys, whether in the spirit realm or on the physical plane, everything they experience is experienced by the source. And that allows the source to fully appreciate the magnificent universe that it has created. And, and, and so it, it gets it, it, it's sort of a vicarious um, feedback to the source about everything that the souls experience. And so that's who creates uh, 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 the souls, and it's all done by the source. Okay, we have a question from Gina. Uh, it says, I increasingly have spirits seeking me out for help. I recently asked one spirit how he found me. Uh, he said that on his side, there is what appears to be a bright light, like a tunnel that leads straight to me. Have you seen anything like this while you were with Albert? And can you explain to me what this is? Well, the bright light is, is, is sort of like a, a lot of people experience going through a tunnel and they end up with a bright light. And that's sort of the entrance for souls to the spirit side. Um, and a lot of people who have had NDEs have reported like going through a tunnel and then hitting the, the, the bright light, uh, which is on the spirit side. And then from there, they can hook up with their spirit guides. They can see some of their beloved uh, people who have previously passed on. Some of them will see a religious figure like Jesus or Mohammed or God himself. Um, and, and, and so that's sort of the, the initial sort of transition from the physical plane over to the spirit side is, is going towards this bright light. So, yeah, it's there. And I've done it on my astral trips when I go to the spirit side. And it's something that we will all go through, as I mentioned, when our souls leave our physical bodies on death. Okay. And the last question we have is from, I apologize if I pronounce this wrong, uh, Gabrielson. Um, it says, will the earth shift be spontaneous or will we have a warning? I'm sorry, the earth shift? The earth shift. Oh, yeah, no, it'll be spontaneous. Uh, there won't be any warning and no one will notice the difference. I mean, it's like when when the, when, when our universe where that our earth is in, when it divides and we have no idea that when that's going to happen, we have no warning. When it divides into two and you have two parallel universes, um, we won't notice it. And the life forms in the one universe that split, uh, they will end up being in two different, the two different universes after the split. And, and nobody will know the difference. And so it's very possible that um, some of us have experienced a split in our universe. And there may, in fact, be another one of us in another parallel universe that we're not aware of. And so it's uh, to, to the surprise of many people, you may in fact have one or more clones living in parallel universes, but you won't know. And when it happens, you won't experience anything and you'll have no warning. Okay, that was the three questions. Um, did you want to do another one or are you good? Uh, sure, let's, let's do another one. Do one more? Okay. Yeah. Um, it looks like we have a question here from Damien. Which of your books most specializes with the New Earth information? Um, the uh, I, I think the third book would be the best one uh, to, to to talk about it. I've talked about it in several of my books, but the uh, the, the third book most talks about the New Earth. Um, but you know, I would recommend to everyone in order to get the the, the full pictures to start with my first book and move on through because I uh, there are discussions about the New Earth and basically in all of them. 
Um, and uh, it, it's really it's really a fascinating topic, uh, and it's a great place to to uh, to yearn towards. And uh, I recommend that everyone try to raise their vibrations so that they can ascend to the new earth. And to do that, it's simple in concept, but difficult in practice. Discard or stifle your negative emotions and fully embrace love, compassion, and forgiveness. That raises your vibrations. And when your vibrational rate matches that of the new earth, you just pop up there, just like if you hold a cork underwater and let it go, the cork just pops up to the top. That's how you will ascend. All right. All right. Um, Garnet, thank you very much. Um, fascinating, fascinating information. Uh, it's just that's going to take me a long time to process all of it. It's wonderful. Um, we uh, will now take a break until one o'clock when our next um, speaker comes on. So thank you everybody for your questions and thank you Garnet for having the courage to write your books and to share your experiences and to take that leap to a whole nother um, life than what you had before and uh, to help enlighten everybody. So it's fantastic stuff. Thank you, Forrest, for those kind words. And uh, I should just add, if, if anyone has a question that I didn't get to, send me an email and I'll try my best to answer it. Great. Excellent. Thank you. All right. We'll see you guys at uh, 1 o'clock. Bye-bye.